Hi, I'm Ozzy Oswald, and welcome to Religion and Life. Science and religion often depart when it comes to the controversy surrounding evolution and creation. Dr. Patricia Kelly, an internationally renowned paleontologist, joins us today to help us navigate the divide between the differing worldviews of evolution and creation. Welcome, Dr. Kelly. Thank you very much. Well, in addition to being a professional geologist, um, you're also an adult Sunday school teacher and uh, the wife of a Presbyterian minister. That's correct. And uh, you've written that some people sometimes wonder if there's not a conflict between those two parts of yourself. And I think that question itself stems from an ongoing perception that somehow uh, the ideas, theories of evolution and theologies of creation are incompatible. And maybe to a larger extent, science and religion are somehow incompatible. And, and you've worked to debunk that notion. Could you maybe get us oriented a little bit about how that works? How do you see the two uh, realms of knowledge um, being compatible with one another, or at least not being incompatible? I think the misconception that science and religion, and particularly evolution and creation, are incompatible in part stems from the fact that scientists haven't done a good job of explaining what science is and how it works. Mm -hmm. So I think that's part of the problem. Um, science indeed does not look to the supernatural for explanations, but that's because science is about testing hypotheses um, about natural phenomena. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to test a hypothesis, you can't introduce any supernatural agents because, for instance, if you say that angels dug the Grand Canyon, <laughs> you, you, you can't test that idea. You can't get an angel to materialize and um, watch it dig, see how fast it digs, etc. Right. So, um, so part of the problem is, is a problem of definition, really. So, uh, yeah. Science limits itself to natural phenomena. That's right. Okay. That's right. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that scientists can't accept phenomena beyond what is natural. Um, right. They just can't can't use non-natural explanations in their in their methods. So you've suggested that part of the problem comes from the side of science and from the uh, inadequate explanations of scientific method. Uh, does part of the controversy also come from the side of, of people with faith, uh, people coming at it from a religious perspective? And where do they um, sometimes uh, have difficulty uh, when, when confronted with these two okay. types of knowledge? I think, I think there's a misperception that religion in general and those who are religious are opposed to science and, and can't be scientists. I've experienced that point of view among my students. Mm -hmm. When I first started teaching about evolution and, and creation um, in Mississippi, <laughs> when I was a, a young professor there, mm -hmm. young faculty member, um, I taught an honors course on that subject. And the first day I came into class and told them what I did, and uh, exactly as you said at the beginning, I'm a, I'm a scientist, I'm a paleontologist, I study evolution, my husband's a Presbyterian minister, um, I teach Sunday school on Sunday, and their jaws just dropped because half the class were scientists and they assumed that they couldn't uh, be religious, and the other half of the class were religious and assumed that they couldn't be <laughs> scientists. And many of them belong to dom denominations, religious denominations, that are very accepting of science and even uh, evolution. <laughs> um, they just didn't realize it. But most mainline denominations, um, especially in the early 1980s when there was a lot of litigation going on, developed statements. Um, approved by the denomination that evolution is not incompatible with, with faith and decrying attempts to include creationism in, in uh, public school science classes. So, so even though the mainline denominations, and, and you know, we could maybe list them, but I don't think we have to, uh, took an official stance mm -hmm. that um, the study of evolution was appropriate um, and that the study of maybe scientific creationism, we'll come back to that in a little bit, was not. Uh, this, the, your students who had grown up in those denominations hadn't gotten the message. They were That's picking true. up an alternative message 
from the culture somehow. Yes, I would say so. Um, and certainly there are denominations that don't accept evolution. Those would be denominations who would hold to what they consider to be a literalist interpretation of right. the Bible. Um, and we can talk about that at some I, point today. Well, I'd love to talk about it. You've written um, actually very persuasively, I think, about um, the creation accounts, uh, and in particular, uh, the two creation accounts in Genesis, Genesis 1 and 2. Um, and I, I was going to ask you if, if most of the resistance to teaching evolution comes from uh, religions that demand, or in this case, Christianity, uh, Christian uh, denominations that demand a literal interpretation, and you've already answered that. Mm -hmm. so, so tell me a little bit about those two creation accounts and the trouble you might run into if you're um, demanding a strict literal reading of Genesis 1 and 2. The creation accounts are, well, the Genesis accounts are two of several creation accounts in the, the Bible, the Old Testament, mm -hmm. um, all of which are different from one another. And modern biblical scholarship indicates, especially for Genesis 1 and 2, where most, where most of the public would, would take their ideas of creation, um, those accounts come from entirely different contexts. Mm -hmm. um, Genesis 1 was written in the 6th century BC um, when the Hebrews were in exile. Um, in Babylon, and the Genesis 1 account parallels very closely the Babylonian procreation account, <laughs> we could right. call it, right. um, because, because creation occurs by various gods and goddesses procreating other gods and goddesses, and mm -hmm. along the way, um, light and dark are separated, and the moon and planets, et cetera, are put in their places. Um, the accounts are, are really nicely parallel. Right. Um, the purpose of Genesis 1 was to affirm monotheism um, within a culture in which the prevailing views were, were polytheistic. Mm -hmm. um, Genesis 2 is actually the older of the two accounts. It dates from the 10th century BC, the time of King Solomon. Um, Solomon uh, is famous for many things, being rich, being wise, uh, and having many concubines and wives who weren't all nice Jewish girls. And so there was very strong uh, temptation to idolatry during the time that, that Solomon was king also. And so the Genesis 2 account is also an affirmation of, of monotheism. Um, the accounts differ in, in very many ways in, in addition to the, the context. Um, and, and let me ask you, do, do, do most I don't want to cut you off here. I want yeah. you to continue. But do most Christians recognize even that there are I don't that there so. are two different, no. very different accounts from different I don't historical think so. eras within different um, contexts? I, I don't. I, I don't think they read I, their Bibles that closely. Well, or, or critically. <laughs> I think you're, critically. You're, you're, yeah. you're right. Yeah. I think just from uh, my experience in the classroom, and I'm, of course, I'm coming from some of these same, uh, coming at some of these same issues, uh -huh. but from the side of religious studies, and um, I do find often that students have have never. Uh, recognize that there are two creation accounts right. in the Bible side by side, and they've never thought critically about it. Um, and and the, the important point there is that the compilers of the Bible knew that they were different, but, right. but put them there exactly. for a reason. Okay. Exactly. Mm -hmm. They were very comfortable with having conflicting stories about how creation took place. Which might tell us something about the difference in ancient culture and our culture. Uh, we're, we're maybe not as, as comfortable with conflict or, or conflictual evidence. Yeah, you know? I think that's true. I think um, modern cultures like everything to, to be very clear cut, very black and white. We don't like ambiguity. Right. Well, the, the thing I take away from your exposition of these texts is that uh, the, the creation accounts in the Bible are probably not even meant to be historical in the sense no. that we think of history. No. Certainly no. not meant to be scientific. Right. I so would it's a, fully agree. It's mm -hmm. a different kind of narrative. Right, um, right. And 
uh, I guess the mistake that, that leads to some of these false perceptions is that we try to impose a scientific uh, template mm -hmm. on texts that are what we would call religious myth or religious narrative. Yeah, they're, they're, they're written in a narrative style, but um, as my favorite theologian Conrad Hires has pointed mm -hmm. out, a narrative style doesn't doesn't mean that the story is factual. You can use a narrative style for a fairy tale, or for an instruction manual, or for a letter, or a parable, as, right. as Jesus does. And, uh, and those narratives don't, the narrative form does not necessarily imply that we are reading a history or um, a scientific account. Mm -hmm. um, we're not reading factual accounts necessarily, but truth doesn't have to be factual. Right. And that's something that I think most people don't think about. And, and you might want to even say a little more about that. I think that's a really important distinction that I don't want us to gloss over, but the, 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 the notion that fact and truth are two different concepts. And it seems to me that in our contemporary culture, those two ideas have been collapsed, and we have difficulty distinguishing between the factual and truth. I guess you might say with a, right. I don't know, a, a big T or something. Right. Like yeah, I think um, the parables of Jesus are, are a good example. He tells he told a lot of stories about the prodigal son, the good Samaritan, whatever, the unjust judge. Mm -hmm. If those people didn't exactly, if those people didn't actually exist, does that mean those stories are false? No, of course not. There are deep truths contained within those stories, but but they're not factual. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In science, we use fact in, I think, a different way than than the public generally would. Um, scientists consider something to be fact if well, essentially, bits of data, observations, those are considered fact. Um, Stephen Jay Gould, who was my PhD advisor, had a definition of fact, and I don't know if I can quote it verbatim, but uh, his definition was confirmed to the extent that it would be perverse to withhold provisional assent. <laughs> So That's a mouthful. That, it is. A, it's a mouthful. It was a I always very have, good paraphrase. Yeah. If it wasn't direct on. <laughs> it's it's close anyway. I always have to write that one on the the blackboard for for my <laughs> students because each word needs needs to be thought about carefully. So confirmed to the extent that it would be what did I say perverse to withhold provisional assent. Got In it. other words, accepted to the extent that you'd have to be crazy to, to deny it. Yeah, that sounds like a religious creed almost. It does, uh, it, it does, does. doesn't <laughs> it? Uh -huh. Doubles back on itself. Yeah, yeah. So if, if, I'm, if I'm hearing you correctly then, uh, a fact in the, in the way it's used scientifically, uh, certainly does not describe what we read in Genesis, but we might call that truth, what we read in Genesis. Yes. If you're a person of faith. Yes. Uh, but, mm -hmm. but fact also, uh, going the other direction, um, and, and I might be wrong here, but a fact also is is not something you would apply to, say, Darwin's theory of evolution, because there's a difference between fact and theory. Is that correct there in a is, scientific sense? There is a difference between fact and theory, and evolution can be used in both senses. Hmm. So I would say that in one sense, evolution is a fact. If you break evolution down to its simplest definition, which is life has changed through time, that's really something that is confirmed to the extent that it would be perverse to withhold provisional assent. <laughs> Back to gold. Yeah. Exactly, right. because we see evidence all around us in, in the world today that life has changed through time. Mm -hmm. um, just the, the development of, of resistance of, of microorganisms to antibiotics, that's evolution. Right. You know, populations are changing in their genetic composition um, as a result of uh, you know, those that can resist the antibiotics surviving and, and, and uh, leaving more offspring behind mm -hmm. than those that, that can't 
survive. And there's actually data that, so, that yeah, traces that development. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so we see evolution all around us, and, and sometimes we cause it ourselves. So all the right. breeds of dogs are, have evolved through human intervention. New mm -hmm. species have in, evolved through human intervention. Or um, without human intervention, we see n new species forming in nature. Um, good examples of it are, are known um, that have happened hmm. in historic time and even in recent time. And then, of course, my specialty is the fossil record. And right. we see all kinds of evidence um, as you go through uh, layers of, of sediments. Um, uh, looking at how, as you work your way up from the oldest layers to younger layers, how life has changed through time. So in that sense, evolution is a fact. Gotcha. You know, there are undis undisputable um, lines of evidence for that. But then, yes, evolution is also a theory in the sense of trying to explain these changes in life through time. And I would argue that evolution is the only valid scientific explanation for these changes in life through time. And that's what Darwin referred to as descent with modification. Good, yeah. Um, <clears throat> what do you think it is about theories of evolution that some people of faith find so threatening? I mean, there, there are other areas of science that, that seem to be readily accepted by uh, people with faith, but um, evolution seems to be a particular um, I guess difficult not to crack. It's just been what uh, almost a century, well, over a century and a half since Darwin published Origin of Species. Uh -huh. um, it's been about almost a century since the Scopes trial. Yet there's still True. this really strong uh, resistance uh, mm -hmm. to theories of evolution. Is is there something about these theories in particular that are threatening to religious faith? Let me make two comments um, okay. coming off of what you just said. Mm -hmm. I think what many people don't realize is that when Darwin published Origin of Species, there wasn't immediate resistance. Um, clergy accepted evolution pretty quickly. The American public, not so right. much, <laughs> but, but um, clergy did. Uh, pretty quickly, and it wasn't until post-World War I that the anti-evolution movement really, really got going with, not with, not with um, mainline denominations, but with individuals, William Jennings Bryan, for right. instance, and, and some um, interdisciplinary organizations. Well, and that, that um, corresponds with the rise of Protestant fundamentalism. The, yes. And, and literalism yes. and interpretation yes. of text. Yes, mm -hmm. that's right. correct. Yeah. Um, so that's just an interesting little aside that, right. that um, I thought of when you, when you made your comment. Uh, why do so peop many people find evolution perturbing? I think what they object to is a, a caricature of evolution in which everything is happening randomly mm -hmm. through random processes. Mm -hmm. And creationist literature will say things like um, evolution is like a hurricane blowing through a junkyard and <laughs> randomly assembling a Boeing 747. <laughs> it just can't happen. You can't get such complexity by random processes. Mm -hmm. Evolution does involve some random processes. Um, mutation is random in that um, it happens spontaneously. It's just mistakes that are made when DNA is, is being copied. Um, in that sense, it, it is random with respect to future usefulness. Mutations don't happen in order to make an organism function better. Mutations right. happen, and then organisms with that mutation sometimes do better and sometimes do worse. Um, so I think there's a misunderstanding of, of the word randomness and also a misunderstanding of what constitutes creation. Mm -hmm. And I'll go back to my favorite theologian, Conrad <laughs> Hires, again. He has a wonderful um, chapter that discusses views of God as creator and going back to Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, the Genesis 1 view of God is a masculine view where God is commanding, let there be light, and right. there was light. 
the Genesis 2 view of God is what we might label a more feminine mm. view, um, where God is down in the dirt. You know, he's making <laughs> things out of, out of you know, the, the dust of the ground. The Gary Larson cartoon, you know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> God makes the snake. This, this thing, these things are a cinch. Out, out of Play-Doh, right? Yeah, yeah. Out of, yeah <laughs> exactly. Um, that's a view in Genesis 2. Mm -hmm. And in Genesis 2, it's more of an experimental approach that, that God is, is using. And yet the Genesis 1 commanding approach is, is more the stereotype um, by which we, we think of God. And yet in the Genesis 2 approach, there's actually a lot more room for, for randomness. Mm -hmm. Hires also talks about, about creativity and how a certain element of randomness is, is necessary in creativity. If you look at the artwork of Jackson Pollock, for instance, right. or um, s ancient artists in Asia who would um, use rags or leaves to paint with just so that they had less control. So I think I think the random issue is perceived as problematic, and right. yet randomness can easily be accommodated um, in one's view of, of how creation occurs. So it sounds like that it might be easier, or maybe there's something in human nature that prefers the God of Genesis 1 who's in charge mm. rather than the God in Genesis 2 who might yeah. be more hands-on with, with uh, creation. It's almost as if the God in Genesis 2 has um, forfeited a little bit of the authority and the power. Yeah, um, that's know. a really interesting view. Yeah. Well, I, I remember I, I used to have a teacher who said that, that most people think that the problem people have with evolution is that it takes God out of the equation, but he thought that it was because um, it took human beings from the pinnacle of creation and just made them part of the ongoing creative process. Uh -huh. So uh -huh. um, I, I don't know, but there does, yeah. se there does seem to be something about this whole uh, idea of evolutionary theory that's particularly troublesome uh, to the theology. Yeah. And that, that helps though to, to, uh -huh. to contrast Genesis 1 and 2. We've, we've got a little time left and I wanted to maybe redirect this just briefly. Um, and it really work, dovetails nicely with what you said about randomness because mm -hmm. one of the um, answers to the problem of evolution from the religious side is this movement known as intelligent design. Mm -hmm. And it seems to be a movement designed to put God back in charge, uh, mm. if you will. Mm. Uh, could you say a little bit about um, creation science or intelligent sure. design? Is it the same thing? Um, yeah, yeah. I think you're going to tell me it's not science, so right, it's, it's uh, something else, but uh, maybe, maybe say a word about that. Maybe. Okay, sure. So in the, um, in the early 1980s, there was a big push to include equal time for what creationists labeled evolution science and creation science, so that when evolution science was taught, creation science would also have to be taught. Um, so there were court cases that um, ruled, for instance, Arkansas Act 590 mm -hmm. as unconstitutional. Um, uh, um, another um, act in Louisiana was also ruled unconstitutional because it violates separation of church and state. Right. Um, the establishment of religion clause. So once that approach failed, intelligent design came on the horizon. Intelligent design was developed in the, the 1990s, but it developed from creationism. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, the textbook that intelligent design proposed to use was the same textbook that creationists were using of pandas and people. They just changed all the word creation or creator to intelligent agent. So it really is a continuation so of the it's same. A, it's yeah. a continuation of creationism and, and um, that was demonstrated in the Dover court case in yeah. 2005, I believe. Um, so yes, it, it is connected, but I think it's, I think it's, um, I think it's insidious. I think it's more dangerous, it's dangerous to science potentially, but it's even more dangerous to religion, and intelligent design. that was design. a very insightful point that you make in your writings, uh -huh. that it's, it's generally perceived to be dangerous to science, but in fact it destroys religion, the yes. very thing it attempts to prop up and yes. support. 
Yes. And I think that's an important uh, yeah. uh, note to make. But the, you know, the, the work you're doing, I mean, it really is kind of boundary crossing. Uh, you're, you're getting scientists to talk to theologians and American religious historians, and um, you're working at the, at the intersection of culture and religion, maybe culture wars in some way. Um, and I, I just find it fascinating. Hmm. Um, and you're on our campus today to talk about some of these issues, and um, um, that's wonderful. We're glad we can do this kind yeah. of inter-campus cooperation <laughs> here, um, even though it requires you to, to uh, drive across state. Uh -huh. But uh, um, I want to thank you uh, for being here today. This is a fascinating topic, and I uh, hope you'll continue to, uh, to write and speak about these issues. Help us to gain more understanding. Thank you. About uh, this uh, perceived conflict between evolution and creation. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you, you for the warm welcome to Appalachian sure. State. Sure, any time you come mm -hmm. back. Well, that's it today for Religion and Life for this week. If you have questions, comments, or suggestions, please contact us at watchapptv.com. Until next time, I'm Ozzy Oswald.